So what we have here is an Edwards bass trombone, um, which I've done a bit of work on the slide already. I just thought it would be interesting to show you the bell because not everyone who, um, not everyone is going to be around high level bass trombones every day. So this is quite a nice one where it all comes apart, um, which is partly, I think, for kind of maintenance for the player to be able to take it apart and service it themselves. But it certainly makes our life easier as repairers when we're taking them to bits. Um, basically, the whole thing will come apart and it's it's kind of amazing. So I was going to just start doing this and kind of talk you through what I'm doing as I'm doing it. These rotors, in case you hadn't seen them already, these are called Thea valves or axial flow valves. Um, they're really interesting. It's just a different take on the rotary valve. The essence is the same. So you've got a, a lever that will turn this, which opens up these other parts of the tubing to kind of alter the key that you're in. Um, it's just a different design. It's just a really clever design. They're really nice to work with and to use. And they're quite low maintenance, really, as long as you set them up right. So. I'll just start taking this apart and um, see how we get on. So first things first, I'm going to take the levers themselves off. These are one of the only things kind of that's going to get in the way later down the line if I don't do it now. So I'm just going to start. It all starts with the tiniest little screw. Um, and so that I don't confuse myself when I'm putting it back together, I'm going to, in my head, call this number one and this number two, and I've got two separate dishes that I am going to keep the bits for each one in. Just makes life easier at the end. You'll um, regret it if you don't do stuff like that when there's more than one identical part going on. So then number two. Now this lever's under a lot of tension, so I... I get so far with the screwdriver and then I just hold it because otherwise that will just go clang into there and we want to try and avoid um, marking anything if we can. This joint in the middle. That can come away. And these guys here. So just a question, would it also make it easier if you've got a repair in just one section and you want better access to that from a de-denting point of view or something like yeah, that? Yeah, massively. Accessibility is always an issue um, with with dents in particular. They can just be in the worst place. And if you've got to do lots of invasive soldering and taking parts off to actually access a dent, then it comes into question as to whether it's worth doing anything about in the first place because you'll be left with other blemishes as a result of that work. So this makes life a bit easier when you're kind of tackling really involved stuff. Now the slide actually kind of holds the whole thing together so you can lose that. There's a very long legs on there. Aren't very there? long legs and very blue on the inside. I don't know if you can see that lovely colour. Have some nice cleaning going on there soon. Yeah, I mean it's worth servicing. To be honest, I've done a replacement leg on this instrument. I'm kind of servicing the bell, just you know, while it's here, why not kind of thing. A replacement leg on the actual playing slide. On the slide, yeah, yep. I have it here. Um, it was really red, rotty. You know, if you can see those pink spots, it's kind of a typical sign of of bad news really when it comes to brass instruments the the player uses in, his instrument all the time so he kind of had had a few weeks where he found he wasn't going to be needing it and thought you know let's just get this done i advised him about two years ago really that that could eventually go through um because it's rotten brass basically it's the copper separating from the brass um, as a result of it being left wet which is totally normal, it's to be expected. We're kind of, we're all blowing stuff down our instruments, so they're gonna get wet, but uh, this one is, I guess he's had it a while. So let me show you what I'm doing here. I'm just loosening off these joins. So there's three of these up here. And now this is all kind of just hanging under tension. The only thing now that's holding this together should be this valve. So I'm just going to spin this free and then if all goes to plan, this comes up and there's one and then 
one more connector and this comes down and that is pretty intense as dismantling goes. Now these rotors are really interesting. This should lift off here. These valves are quite delicate but you can see the internal workings. You can kind of get the gist of how it would work. See how that moves. It lines up to a different hole, comes back here. So you can see you're just redirecting the flow of the air whenever you're pressing those triggers. It's very clever, very clever. I suppose it lets it straight through up there as well, doesn't it? As opposed to sending it round. Yeah. It's a slight curve, but. Yeah, the point of these, of these valves in particular, they've been designed, I think, for the most efficient flow of air. So that they just, there aren't any <coughs> sharp things. The fact that these are cut in the angles that they are. Um, gorgeous bit of engineering actually it's really when you look nice at it. it's yeah. really really nice and it's a it's a pleasure to work on with other valves you can use kind of abrasives on them a process called lapping in that people may have heard if they've had brass instruments serviced which you do do a similar thing on rotors maybe not as um as heavily as piston valves but these shouldn't need it at all actually they've got a plating on them which should basically just need you to just wipe them down degrease them put them back in they should never need anything more than that um so despite the fact you could you could think that potentially this is a lot more complicated to service because there's more bits and mm. yes you need to know which bits are going where but because of the design quality are you kind of angling at the fact that actually it's it's more routine to service in a way um, or more longer lasting perhaps because it helps if you've seen one before i think if you've never taken one apart before they can be a little bit intimidating but once you've done it a few times it's so logical and it's so um it's so nicely made. Everything just fits perfectly. That once you've um, once you're familiar with it, it's it's fine, and it really speed things up. I saw a dent actually somewhere that could be a good example of one that would otherwise be inaccessible. It was around this rotor. Is he just there? So. With all of the trombone together, there'd be basically no chance of accessing that without having to put force on things. But now I've got it apart, I can use a straight bar up here and just pop that out while it's apart, which is nice. It's just nice to be able to you know, partition it all off and work on individual parts. So we've covered lots of positive things. Are there any negatives with these? Are there things that crop up you know, from a point of view of servicing, or do they are they fairly smooth sailing for most players? They're pretty smooth sailing. I see sometimes people want to maintain their own valves. I think it's a good thing, really. People should be able to oil and grease and maintain their own instruments. But these are a little bit, in, like I say, intimidating even for repairers sometimes. So if you're a person who owns one of these and you've never taken one apart, they almost encourages you to try because it's kind of it's designed to be taken apart. And these rings here. This is kind of acts as a leveling plate for this whole top and the bottom section. They come together, same, it's, um, this ring is basically what tightens them together. And if it's not dead flat, then the rotor can be a little bit dodgy, it's just a little bit less than perfect. So we do get people quite often that are coming in saying, oh, it doesn't feel right, and all it needs is half a turn here, and it's fine. So if I suppose that, that could be a little bit temperamental. Again, it's just familiarity with the, the way it's all supposed to feel. Um, but other than that, I, I, you could assume that perhaps these joints would all be weaker if they're threaded, but I've never seen that before. I suppose you could argue that these threads and so on, because they're so infrequently moved, that they might seize up. Um, but whenever I take one of these apart, I make sure to put a really thick grease on those threads just to make sure that next time, should I be the one taking it apart, I won't, um, I won't it, wish I had. It will move, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cool. It just it makes life easier for the next person that takes it apart if you just grease everything really well when it goes back together. Um, okay. But yeah, I'm just going to start cleaning this now and then put it back together basically, just the reverse process. Um, nothing too complex because it's not really uh, in a bad way at all. It's just a little bit dirty. So we'll clean this up and get it back together. So I'm going to polish the slide legs. So the legs of these slides this one came out quite nicely. They all came out quite nicely, but you can see them oxidizing. You can see this kind of dryness start to um, appear. If you actually scratch it with your nail as well, that's a, a sure sign that that is actually going to cause problems. So I'm just degreasing them firstly, because they've got slide grease on them. And now I'm going to put them on slide jig, which is a bit of a DIY tool, but it's very, very useful. So 
these foam strips are what I tend to use um, for polishing slides. They're just super quick and they, they bring them up really, really well. It hardly takes any material off. It, they actually say that they're 400 grit, but they're nowhere near. They're way, way finer than that. Um, but if you've got solid build up on the slide legs, it can just make them the move so badly. Um, they can start to grip, which usually ends up with them seizing completely. So it's better to just clean them up. Usually I would go over this with a little bit of Tripoli on a rag as well, which I'm just gonna grab. So Tripoli is like a clay, basically. A really, really fine, finer polish. So it removes any other polishing marks as well as bringing the brass right up to mirror finish, which is nice. So doing that will have removed a little bit of material which will potentially have left something on these legs. I am going to wash them through anyway, but you see all that black that comes off just from the abrasive. Um, but that's much better. I'm happy with that. It's not that dirty anyway, but it's just about taking the edge off really. So this blue on the inside, um, I'm just going to clean that through in the sink upstairs, I think. Just washing instruments through with a bit of warm water and fairy liquid does them the world of good. I don't think that needs anything more severe than that. Um, you can use like a kettle descaler in extreme circumstances if it's really bad. But if it's that kind of colour, I, I think that's just going to come off. I think it'll be all right. Cool. Right, so... I'm at the glamorous washing station and I'm going to see if I can do something about this um, this build-up in here. I, th I thought it would be possible without going hard with chemicals, so let's find out. You want to use water that's not too hot. This has got a lacquer on the surface and if you plunge it into really, really hot water it can burn and you'll be left with like an opaque, like milky finish and it, sometimes the lacquer actually peels away like sunburn as well. So. I tend to try and go for somewhere in the middle. I find that cold water doesn't froth up so much. Hot water damages the lacquer. So somewhere in between, a nice lukewarm water would be great. Now these flexible brushes are just perfect. They're literally made for washing through instruments. Generous with the fairy liquid on the head that's going to be the best fit. And you can just scrub and scrub and the way they froth up would start to lift all of that dirt. Now, there's two types of flexible brushes. One of them it has a metal stem. One of them, this one is uh, nylon, I think. Um, and I tend to go for these plasticky ones just because the metal ones, when you're doing this, you can hear them kind of grating on the edge sometimes. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Although I, I imagine they're stronger. I guess that's the idea is that they're considerably stronger product and longer lasting. Um, the heads on these do sometimes snap off, which is a nightmare when it happens inside the instrument. Um, the brushes do compress, but you get months out of them. Uh, and I mean, we're washing stuff through almost every day, multiple times a day. An average person using one of these brushes would keep it for years, I'm sure. Right, so I'm just concentrating a little bit more on the ends. And then I'm just going to give it a rinse through. So quite a lot has come off. We've been left with like a little bit here, nothing too scary. Okay, so I'm going to repeat this process for every part of the horn, really. I've, I've only done this one as an example to show you. Usually I just come up here and do it all in one go and you can be sat up here for half an hour just washing things through. Um, but yeah, that, that I'm happy with that. I don't want to necessarily take any chemicals to it unnecessarily and um, yeah, I think it's nice and clean. So I'm just going to go and grab the other slides, do the same with them and then start putting this thing back together.